He has to now take that to the committee of the board at the Hewlett Packard. And Carly Fiorina at the time has to come into that meeting and listen to him play this and say, eh, you know that case that I told you we were going to win? Not so sure anymore. And that's why you do these things, to create leverage, right? What did Marty and Matt do in trial and Nolta and all the other trials? They created leverage, evidence, and trial, and on and on and on. You can do the same thing pre-trial. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. That's one example. There are many other ways. So now, I want to play this for you. How you take a DVD, you plug it in. You don't like our invention? Turn it off, Hewlett Packard, and see how a DVD plays with our invention turned off. how Hewlett Packard uses our invention today. tell you in the focus groups that we did, and we did many in preparing this case, um, you know, and I would go through all kinds of tutorials and explaining all the right through and copy back in much greater depth and all kinds of things that, that I didn't do here. What did they get? They understood this. You know, when you would you'd watch the juries deliberate behind you know, opaque glass and hear their conversations, this they understood. Guess what? A judge would understand this. This would have some impact. What do we do in the settlement? I mean, after we tried sued three entities, settled with them before trial, and did 17 licenses. Every time we had a meeting with the next defendant, we had their computer. They came into the meeting, they set it up. We set, set it up, did exactly this, turn it off, turn it on. Oh, you've done something wrong with our computer. You've jimmied it up, you've done something. We had the top 20 questions that any technical person would ask about what we'd done wrong, and here's the answers. Here they are, we, we, we've not done anything wrong. And then and we'd give them the computer and then take it back and, Eventually, we get the license that we wanted, right? So, hopefully, you look at that and say, you know, well, that's nice, Manning. Hopefully, you might conclude that that's kind of cool. But the reason I show it is for this reason: is that if you did this today in any federal court in the United States, and if you won, you went to the Federal Circuit, you'd lose. And if you tried it in a sophisticated Federal District Court, you would also lose, like in front of Judge Alsop in San Francisco, who just tried the, the uh, Oracle v. Google case. And these two documents explain precisely why 
you would lose, why I would lose, and why we would lose. And so let me go on and illustrate then the how about quantification with another example. Litigation against a major DRAM manufacturer on behalf of a manufacturing practicing entity who doesn't practice any of the patents at all, just like Marty said. You know, I think it's very interesting, Judge Rader, the chief of the Federal Circuit, I love his definition. and I've seen him do it at the conference in Berkeley with everybody in Silicon Valley sitting in there. He says, you know, everybody talks about trolls and NPEs. Let me give you the definition of a troll or an NPE. You all want to do it a certain way, a non-practicing entity. You want to do, beat up on a troll, create bad guys. So what they are is that anybody can be an NPE or a troll. Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, Google, he said it's anyone who asserts a patent beyond its value. That's a troll. That's an NPE. I love that definition because he said the Constitution protects invention. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And, and I, I love his passion about that. At the same time, he is the one who has led almost single-handedly these 10 cases that have dramatically changed the patent landscape in the US to require quantification of damages. So he has answered the rebuttal that's coming out about trolls and NPEs by saying, you know, do the damage models properly and there's not a problem. So let's, let's show how you do that. Here's seven patents. We took every single one of these patents. We have here a uh, statement. I just want to say this real quickly. It's a statement of the invention. And I always try to take every patent because, you know, there's 30 claims and 15 elements to each claim. But we try to then just write one statement of the invention that's consonant with the claims and the specification so you can actually have an intelligent conversation in a conference room with experts and, and whatnot about the patent. Otherwise, you're always going down and talking about this element, and somebody makes this point, and then somebody wants to make a point about this, and where does the conversation go? So I think it's very important to develop a statement of the invention. And one picture of the invention that captures it. Okay? So we took the same benefits approach that we talked about in Intergraph, and we looked at all one of the, these patents. Let me just tell you that these three patents right here became foundational patents. How? Lawyers, experts, inventors, working Socratically, asking and answering dumb questions incessantly. We tried to do it with these. Not a one of them became a foundational patent. These patents drove 3 million. These patents drove 300 plus. If you can blow life into an incremental patent and make it a foundational patent within the bounds of the law, within the bounds of ethics, and within the bounds of technical accuracy, it's the only way it can be done then you have a foundational patent, team approach. So we had an early, early mediation in that case, and we presented for a day a billion dollar damage model shortly, shortly after the Intergraph case and before this started, because it starts in 08. Okay, it's the last five years that this has occurred. And a lot of lawyers in the US don't understand it. And frankly, I think very few outside understand it because it's, it's difficult, and it's difficult to put this together. We were forced to. So we presented a billion dollar damage model that was not based on this law. We had to evolve in our case with the law. I want to chat a little bit about a theory of the case, just for fun. We'll go a little bit sideways with me for just three minutes. Uh, I know Marty can speak about this. He's got a fa fabulous lecture on it, Matt as well. The lawyers, we always want to try to find the theory of our case. It's different than the statement of the invention I spoke about. It's a theory of the case that holds it together, that's short, sweet. And, and you, you, you look for, people say find it within the first month or two months, and rarely does that happen. And I want to talk about what's possibly the most well-known theory of the case, because it illustrates a point I want to make better than this theory. Um, and that is, there's a famous case that was tried in the United States criminal court uh, against a defendant, uh, and he was acquitted, and he was charged with murder of two individuals, his wife or ex-wife at the time, and her boyfriend at that, his, at that time. He was a former football player. Does anybody know the case? Not, not the U.S. Anybody know the case? Pardon? O.J. Simpson. Thank you. O.J. Simpson. 
And something happened in that case. That, it's a very tragic case because in the civil case, he was easily found liable, not guilty because you only found liable in the civil case, unfortunately. But the prosecutors really messed that case up. Everybody knew that this guy murdered his wife and the fellow that she was seeing. It's a terrible, tragic thing, honestly. And, and you know, our, our jurisprudence system, it failed. It failed miserably. There's books that are written about it. And different prosecutors have prosecuted that case. I am convinced, as, as millions are, that he would have been found guilty. The evidence was overwhelming. But many mistakes were made, and that's not the subject of the book, but what, or that's not the subject of the conversation, the subject of many books, and I think quite fascinating. But there was a lawyer there who's now deceased, Johnny Cochran, who was defending O.J. Simpson, and he did something brilliant. You know, remember, he tried on the gloves, because when the murder took place, there were gloves on. And, you know, they heard him throw it against the wall, and on and on and on. And the gloves were sitting in the courtroom, and the prosecutors made a huge mistake of having him go up and try the gloves on. And he was an actor, too, and he didn't... And what did you hear? 20, if it wasn't 30 times, I mean, it was 50 times in closing argument from his lawyer. If the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. Famous line. Everybody's heard it in America. If I, if I ask this question in an audience in America, everybody knows the theory of the case. If the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. That's a successful theory of the case. Okay, you've heard my views on the case. We've made a decision in our country long ago when we threw off the yoke of the English, as you have done. When we threw it off, we decided that it was far better to err on the side of having 10 guilty people walk free than it was to have one innocent person found guilty. So you know, in England, the folks who founded our country, they appeared in front of the king, they were guilty until they proved themselves innocent. They reversed the burden, right? In that case, it's a perfect example where people know that someone was guilty and the system failed, right? So what did we, what do you, how do you find a theory of a case in a patent case? The claims and things like that, it's hard, right? But you gotta try to find it throughout the case. So here, what was the theory of the case in this one involving a DRAM manufacturer? Take now. Pay later. Not quite as sexy as, you know, if the gloves don't fit, you must have quit. But take now, pay later. Can we bring that alive? Not everything is Googleable. Remember that. Not everything is searchable. We still have two feet, and there's all kinds of things that never get put up into the World Wide Web. But we've all somewhat forgotten that, right? We think it's truly all out there. Well, the best expert, in the, and there were two, there's two, we had one, the opposition had the other, these were well-funded corporations, and we found the speech that he had given, keynote address, at a law review symposium at a major university, but law review symposiums are not like terribly well attended, they're academic, you know, minutia. And this speech we found out about, one of our associates went as a sleuth into a library and made friends and found that it had been trans transcribed. And so when we showed up to take his deposition, the expert, where we were saying we were entitled to a billion dollars and he said we were entitled to a million dollars, here was the speech he had given. Imagine what you could do with this in seven hours of a deposition. This product, this one right here, that we all know we have in our pockets, likely has a thousand patents on it that relate to this. And there are likely hundreds that are pretty important and only a fraction of those are owned by this company or licensed by this company, he's talking hypothetically. So if you're the CEO and you want to come out with this product, what's the right thing to do? Well, what a great question, right, in international business to ask. What's the right thing to do? That, that's a good question to ask. Sincerely, how often is it asked? Are you going to call all those up in 50 or 100 and try to go cut a license? Are you going to do that, the right thing? Well, even if they only want a tenth of a percent, it doesn't work economically. Stand up giving a speech now. Are you going to hire a lot of lawyers to write invalidity opinions against those 50? No, you're not going to do that. What you end up doing is you ignore the problem for now. You move ahead with the product, and if somebody sues you for patent trick, you figure out a way to settle for pay. Take now. Pay later. What is it? It's a theory of the case out of the mouth of the defendant. What was Johnny Cochran's theory of the case with O.J. Simpson? It was the mistake made by the prosecution. He didn't invent the theory. He took it from the evidence. 
find the theory of the case that speaks out from the evidence that you're going to be able to use to convey your theme in opening statement, closing argument, to a judge, whenever. So in here, it's DRAM litigation. It's a memory chip, okay, you know, memory the size of our fingernail, two billion transistors on the chip, you know, about 16 of them on a, on a plug-in. We all know what they're like. Memory chip, dedicated circuitry for you that enhances it for continuous burst mode and selective enabling of sense amplifiers, in which you read. You're supposed to be reading every word, right? That's the statement of the invention for this patent. And I'm going to show two patents that became foundational patents, right? How? Here's prior art, shared circuitry for the subarrays. So we've got subarrays, and on this little, little uh, you know, size of my fingernail, there's two, because that's the way a patent's written. There's probably 30 to 40 subarrays, right? And there's one X register and one X decoder and one Y register and one Y decoder for all the subarrays. Because what's the mantra in semiconductor manufacturing and design is it's less real estate, faster, cheaper, you know, more efficient. That's the mantra. What's the nature of an invention typically? It's when the inventor does something that's counterintuitive, goes against the grain goes against all the standard thinking, if it's a real invention. If it's an invention that has the possibility of being claimed and becoming a foundational patent. So what was Pearl Chang's invention? Elegant. She said, let's put a whole lot more real estate on that thing the size of a dime with two billion transistors on it. Let's have one X register, one X decoder, one Y register, one Y decoder for every subarray, for every single one. Boom, 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 boom. They're kidding. They're not going to put that kind of real estate on there. Well, let's, what, let's see what happens with dedicated circuitry. Let's see what kind of, what it does. It enables overlapping. What's the goal up here? We all know the goal. What does the overlap operation allows for? It allows for continuous burst mode. Down here. Now we're going to get you know, billions of transactions a second. Billions of transactions a second. And that's what's now happening with Pearl Chain. It allows for continuous burst mode and greater speed, greater efficiency, more real estate. And so we illustrate that because this, we're dealing with microscopic things, as we all know, nanotechnology, as we all know. So we illustrate it through animation, one way, and now for a 10th grade jury and a judge. It's illustrated another way. Same thing. How do we get a steady stream of data? Well, that's what's happening with these subarrays. Now imagine 30 of them. Imagine this happening. And of course, you would build it out if you needed to or wanted to. It gives you a steady stream of data. So you now got a picture in mind, right? Hopefully. Hopefully there's some entertainment value. It's got to be a little weird to get entertained by these things. Come on. But I mean, you know, we're all patent litigators or patent lawyers. I get turned on by this stuff. And the infringement proof, when we did our mediation and we gave a presentation for the billion dollar damage model, we had 21 of these. Remember, there were seven patents. We built these drawers. The infringement proof was phenomenally complicated. We did it in both uh, electronic copy as well as hard copy. So you could walk right back and pick out an exemplar processor and open that drawer and see each and every claim element color coded. But I won't go through that. I'm just trying to point out that what we did in the mediation make a presentation for an entire day and a half on all seven patents and why collectively they were worth a billion dollars. And all that was a part of it. So the Chang is faster, is better, it's a simple theme, but is it quantified? Have I done anything yet with this patent to show quantification? Not close. I mean, I hope it was a nice animation. I liked it. Hopefully I've got a judge or a jury leaning my way, but have I quantified for the record? Have I quantified for the federal circuit for Judge Rader? who has these 10 cases. There's a sustainable damage theory. It requires elements, technical improvement, quantification, and then the royalty. In the past, it was here and here. It wasn't here. This is the last five years, OK, right here. So we apply this to, to Chang. Technical improvement, expert testimony, the architecture facilitated a 25% increase in DRAM speed. From this. 1333 megahertz to this. Those are the billions of transactions coming out. Okay, 25% increase. We could prove that. 
But that's not enough. That's the technical testimony. How's it quantified? That's quantified technically. How do I quantify it quantifiably before it goes to a royalty rate? That's the new requirement. An increase in D rim from this to this allow for price increase or premium which changed over time. So now I can only show you this, but we hired a quantification expert. Believe it or not, there's somebody out there for everything, and there's a person. This one happens to be at the University of Texas, and he has studied DRAM pricing for about 28 years of his life. Shocking. You ask him a question, he doesn't speak back in sentences. He doesn't speak in paragraphs. You ask the question, he speaks for 20 minutes. Wait a minute, I've got to get a word in here edgewise. And you ask another question. Extraordinary. Okay, brilliant guy, but lo and behold, he could actually take this and quantify it. Very difficult working with him. But let me just say, what happened here? We had all kinds of things behind this that I can't show you. It's obviously confidential. But the difference between the two lines shows the price premium that was commanded by this invention. Speed increase over time. You know, price over time, 250 at the beginning versus two bucks here without the invention, here with, and of course, it's a commodity item, so it decreases over time. You've got to be honest. But guess what? Right here, this, this nickel, this dime, the difference between these two lines, it's a whole lot of money, right? It's a whole lot of money. And particularly, you've been honest all the way along. Now, your damage model is likely less than it was before this started. That's what Judge Rader wanted to do. So the damage models have decreased in the US, and they've decreased substantially. Um, and it's a fact, a patent litigation, just an utter fact because of, of what's required here. That's one illustration. I'm going to do one more and be done and turn it over to Matt. This DRAM litigation, here's one more patent, Sakamoto, 893 patent. And we trend here. So, so Pearl Chang's invention was the architecture of the chip, right? Architecture of the chip. Now we're down to is a transistor. So now we're going to look at 2 billion transistors. If I went on to the next patent, which I'm not going to do, I would be talking with you about a contact because there's a contact for each and every one of these transistors that's four nanometers. But that's the next patent, and we don't have time to do that. But anyway, so here's the transistor. And let's, let's just get oriented here. What, what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about nanometers, right? So what's a nanometer? Your fingernail grows in one minute. Excuse me, in 60 seconds, approximately nanometer a second. So in now, with where chips are down to versus at this time, now in one minute your fingernail is growing two transistors every minute. Think about that. Okay? <laughs> As to what two billion transistors really means. It's a way to bring that alive, what I just did uh, in a different way too with the judge, but we won't do that. So when turned on, transistors apply voltages to create a channel for current to travel across the depletion region. This is the depletion region. Here's a gate, source, drain, substrate. We all know, uh, 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 you know, zeros and ones, transistors, right? So we're going to turn it on. There's the depletion region. That's the channel. Depletion region below it. And now we'll show a 100 nanometer flat transistor has sufficiently long channel here, and it works properly. We watch the current go from the source to the drain, and it functions just beautifully. Well, that's great, but that's 100 nanometers, man. We want to make those transistors smaller. We want to get double the number of transistors. Let's make them smaller. Well, let's try to do that. So let's take a 75 nanometer flat transistor. It's flat, isn't it? Just like this. And let's run that current from the source of the drain. Oh my gosh, look what happens. Current goes up into the gate and down into the substrate. And you got a defective transistor and it's gone. Can't use it. Very expensive, right? That's the problem. Now we're looking at the problem that needs to be solved, right? So what did Sakamoto do? He created a longer channel by recessing the gate into the silicon substrate. Look at that. Wow. And what did he do? He made it longer, didn't he? And he made it shorter. So we've achieved a very elegant solution. Sakamoto transistor, it's of course curved in three dimensions, so we can't just show it in two dimensions in animation. We've got to show it in three dimensions. 
And so we build a model like this that we can take apart, and there it is. Here's the prior art, and I could assure you if I had shipped this over and I passed it around like we do with the judge or jury, you'd really be shocked at how big this is versus how big this is. But that, they built the scale, so we're gonna have somebody who will talk about what it was to build these and what it means to build these precisely to scale for foundation to illustrate the point to the jury. This is a real invention. This is a foundational invention. Did it fall off the shelf into our lap? I can assure you it didn't. That's all I can tell you. I can assure you that it didn't. So infringement, just to show it to you, did a teardown analysis. Here's the invention, of course, the picture. Here's a teardown analysis. The best infringement case you can do is if you don't, you're not dependent on them for their documents. And you can actually do a teardown and do the analysis. So here it is, color coded, you can see. You can see it's curved here, spherical, et cetera, just like here. Go through all that with experts. We did it with state-of-the-art scanning capacitance microscopy images that show the location of the source, the drain region, the transistor, and the accused devices. Okay. It's all wonderful, fun, really great stuff for people like me with no science background to be able to work with these brilliant scientists and ask all these dumb questions. And lo and behold, there's answers if you keep asking long enough. So smaller is better. That's cool. In the old days, we would have gone here from smaller is better to the royalty expert. Can't do it, got to go through the green circle, got to go through quantification, got to go through the last five years of the case law. So the defendant would have suffered a significant loss in DRAM chip output. Here's the 100 nanometer transistors, non-infringing right here. Here's the 75 nanometer transistors that are infringing. And obviously you're going to see, you can get a whole lot more of these on the wafer than you can on these. But what does that mean economically? What does that mean? quantifiably. I've got to hire another expert. It's already expensive enough. Everybody's complaining about the cost of patent litigation. I've got to pay the technical expert all that money. I've got to pay the royalty expert all that money. Yeah, I've got, to, I've got to pay a new expert. So it's a tough game to play. It's a real tough game to play to do it right. So the value of this loss is DRAM output is significant and measurable. Without the Sakamoto invention, you're here. With the Sakamoto invention, you're here. The resulting value to defendant, done quantifiably by a quantification expert, I can't go into the great details of that, 17 to 22 percent of DRAM incremental profits. You can put a calculator in that. It's real money. What we're able to do in a mediation when we're presenting this billion dollar damage model, we're able to show them this. We've done it and show it to them six months before trial. What's the wonderful thing about a mediation okay, with a mediator there? And, and trying to get a result and not subject yourself to the risk of trial. Because Marty and Matt can tell you the risk. They know. They've been there. And, 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 and if you've never experienced what it is to wait for a week for a jury to come back, it's an extraordinary experience <laughs> after you've spent three years of your life preparing for it, right? It's extraordinary. And, and then knowing as you sit there, when the jury comes back, to come back in your favor and that you got a 50% chance of reversal in the federal circuit. Because when they say that the appeal to the Federal Circuit is de novo, that means they're going to take a brand new look at it. That's what it means. And Forty-five minutes. It was fun. I mean, you, you, would, you could see what was going to happen. I mean, we had a real shot now at resolving that case because we had prepared the case totally for trial. It's a great misnomer. How do you get a settlement before trial? Be totally ready to try your case and show the other side that you're a trial lawyer and that you're ready to try the case. And you'll want to. Bring it on. Let's go. We have prepared the case. Now the fun is left. And that's what results in moving money from one side of the table to the other. How do you do a 10 to 1 return on investment? I've said we, these two cases, a billion bucks. That means these two clients paid 100 million bucks. Did we make 100 million bucks? No, we made 60 million. We paid 40 million to those experts from Princeton and Stanford and Carnegie Mellon. Now, when they paid us 60, I can tell you, we have a lot more people. We've got 25 people, 20 people working on this case. PhD scientists, lawyers, associates, very complex. Lots of people, lots of witnesses, and on and on and on. So, yeah, it's expensive. 10 to 1 return, I'd love to get a 10 to 1 return. I'm not willing to take the risk. You know, last time I checked my investments, I'm above 2%, maybe you know, 
little under 3%. That's not a very good return. But now you heard in some of the conversations down here yesterday. You heard what's happening, and it's going to kind of happen around the country, around the world. You heard it with the AOL case and whatnot. Shareholders are coming. Very sophisticated, big-time shareholders buy a chunk of the company, and they come and they say, oh, board of directors, do company X. Get some value out of your IP. And if you don't, we're bringing a shareholder suit, and we're going to get people on this board, and all of a sudden, there's some real interest and energy in the intellectual property, right? So, you know, it's big risk and big reward, but if you're not taking the risk when you have the money to take the risk on behalf of your shareholders, and you should because you have a real chance of recovery, but what if you've never even done the analysis? What if you've never tried? Sure, you've got your portfolio and you've got some analysis, but have you ever tried to take your best pearls that are incremental and make them foundational? If you haven't, I would say as a board of directors, as management, you're not doing your job. And you're going to see people asserting that cause of action more and more. So we had a 10 to 1 return without summary judgment. We faced summary judgment, but we won. We resisted it. You're going to get them in every case. They're going to try to take their shot. They're going to try to win. Prepare for it the day you file your case, not you know, uh, 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 the day you get the motion and have 30 days to respond for it without trial or appeal. How? Remember, that was the title of the talk, How You Move a Billion Dollars from One Side of the Table to the Other. I'm trying to make good on the promise of the title. How do you do that? Well, everybody in this room knows the answer to that question. And there's two answers. Every one person in this room knows the answer to this question. How? We try, as lawyers in the legal process, to control the process. We're control freaks. Don't let it control you. It is trying to control the uncontrollable. But that's what we are asked to do. And we try. And we fail, but we try. And how do you control the process? How do you control the process? And this is a thing that every single person sitting in this room knows only so well. Or you wouldn't be sitting in this room because you're a very successful person if you're sitting here. You've passed exams. You've gone to school. You've, you've you know, feared failure. But you're successful in some way, which is why you're sitting here. You want to be successful in patent litigation. It's the same way you were successful to get here times 100. Times 100. How? It's through meticulous preparation. Because what happens in the legal profession? I'm not practicing against the doctor who we're both collaborating to try to help the patient. I'm not pra you know, practicing with a dentist who we're going to send to a specialty. I'm practicing against this guy who's smarter than I am. No question about it. No question that he's smarter. That's the only way I can win is if I can do things way in advance of him and out-prepare him and out-prepare him and out-prepare him. And if I can out-prepare him and his team, possibly I've got a shot at doing some of what I've talked about here, about talking to the client, about talking to that fellow's client, whether it's through some of the demonstrative evidence or whether it's through mediation or whatever. And then I get to go home and not try the lawsuit. Wish I could. Miss some fun, but the client's happy. They got a 10 to 1 return. So I thank you very, 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 very much.